After seeing how political cartoons have developed in Europe, let's take a look across the Atlantic on how political cartoons have been going on in America since before the Revolution. Here we have something you might have seen in your high school history books, the famous Join or Die image, which a lot of people say is the first political cartoon in America, and many argue the first ever political cartoon, at least in a newspaper. So this was produced by an American named Benjamin Franklin. You might have heard of him. Uh, if you don't, check your wallet for a $100 bill. He should be in there. <laughs> Some people tie this directly to the American Revolution, but actually this came much beforehand. So Benjamin Franklin and a bunch of other uh, Americans had this idea that they could better uh, defend themselves during the French and Indian War, uh, what they called the Seven Years' War in Britain, by forming together the militias of the local colonies. Here we have New England, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Maryland, Virginia, and North and South Carolina. So each one is uh, possibly able to defend themselves, but if they put the, all their resources together, they could form a much stronger union. This was built on a lot of the ideas of the uh, Iroquois Indians, uh, basically hijacked from them. So that if, you know, a, a group of Native Americans attacked Pennsylvania, then the militias of New Jersey and New York and Maryland and Virginia could all swarm in there and defend it. So Pennsylvania itself might fall if it were on its own, but together, uh, nothing could stop them. So much like this metaphor of a snake. A snake all put together is very formidable, especially this one where you have a forked tongue, which means that it's poisonous. Just a little biology for you. But if you were to run across a snake that's all chopped up, that's not very threatening at all. Just, just a little creepy. Here's an example as political cartoons are developing through the early 1800s. This is during the Jeffersonian era, when during those Napoleonic Wars we talked about, America wasn't really sure what it wanted to do. A lot of people said, let's back France. Uh, other people said, well, let's back Britain. We speak the same language. For the most part, though, they decided, well, we're going to remain neutral. And that worked well across the Atlantic, but as American shipping was going over those places, uh, they had a lot of problems with uh, sailors getting hijacked and shanghaied, and, and they decided what we're going to do is form an embargo. We'll just not have any merchants going to any of Europe. We'll go elsewhere. A great idea if you are a Virginian and own a plantation like Jefferson, where you try to take care of everything yourself, but if you're from New England and a lot of your economy depends on trade, not very popular. And we can see this critique of how, how good it is. So we have this guy saying, damn it, how he nicks him. And we have our icon, so a, an image that represents something else of the embargo, which is a turtle. Which, of course, is not known for speed or efficiency or really anything good. Instead, uh, he is just the embodiment of how awful this thing is. So here we have this turtle biting a guy, this cursed oh grab me, which is very clever 19th century wordplay. Embargo spelled backwards is oh grab me. And it's grabbing this guy, stepping on his license. So this is a guy who's trying to do what he can to get his goods to market. He, they're super fine. They're great. He does have his license, but instead it slows him down and bites him. And it's awful. Meanwhile, here in the background, we have all these smugglers out here flying two flags, which is not what you're supposed to do at sea. So he's saying that the only effectiveness of the embargo is to harm people who are actually trying to do things the right way. And that makes for a pretty good political critique. So you can really get some good images across just through political cartoons. Let's fast forward then to the 1850s, and here is Thomas Nast, the father of the American cartoon. That's what it says on his tombstone. So Thomas Nast uh, was born in Germany. He moved over as an early teenager when his uh, parents immigrated to America. And he, as an immigrant, didn't have a lot of skills, but he could draw really well. And so that's what he dedicated his life to. Uh, there in the 1850s, photography hadn't quite worked out yet, and so he got one of his early jobs as a cartoonist for the newspaper to draw images of the major events happening at the time. Which, today you'd have a photographer, but back then they, they didn't have all that gear ready yet. 
So one of his early gigs was uh, moving with a reporter to follow the battles of the Italian re Unification Wars in the 1850s. Uh, he would uh, follow the armies around, and when they had a battle, he'd go up on a hilltop and, and draw it. And then he would uh, get an engraving done of the picture, send it over to uh, New York, and it would be republished in all the papers. So a pretty cool gig. Uh, after the war was over, though, that, that means there wasn't anything to report on anymore. So he came back to New York and uh, got started uh, focusing on his political cartoons, this time with a magazine called Harper's Weekly. He soon had a new war to cover, this one, the American Civil War. Uh, here we have one from 1863, and this is a Santa Claus um, visits the army. So here we have these Union soldiers out here, and they're welcoming Santa Claus. And here's Santa looking very political in his uh, Stars and Stripes suit, and giving some toys to the drummer boys and canned goods and all kinds of good times, kind of supporting the troops, which, uh, as we'll see, Thomas Nast was very much a supporter of the Union and a die-hard Republican in those uh, early days of Republicanism. So much so that, in fact, he came up with these images that we still use to this day. So not only did he draw Santa Claus, uh, which Santa Claus, of course, goes back thousands of years, St. Nicholas and things, but if we look at Santa Claus in different countries, uh, he has very different appearances. So, for example, in Britain, he, uh, he's very tall and gaunt, this Father Christmas character. So after the poem, A Visit from St. Nicholas by Clement Moore, uh, which was illustrated by Thomas Nast, here in America, we got this image of kind of a short, uh, rotund, very jolly, uh, super nice, super chubby Santa, which of course Coca-Cola later picked up in the 1880s, and that's widespread all over the world today, all going back to Thomas Nast's illustrations. So not just Santa, but uh, as a Republican, he invents the Republican elephant. So they're powerful, they're mighty, they, they remember, you know, they're, they're willing to trumpet what they need to do. He also created the Democratic donkey, uh, which was intended as an insult, but they became so popular that they adapted it and it, it became the working man's symbol. So both the Democratic donkey and Republican re elephant from him. And here we have a political cartoon uh, talking about this uh, Democratic leader that Thomas Nass didn't agree with, uh, trying to put together these uh, broken planks of a bridge uh, over chaos, but of course the Republican vote is enough to scare him off. Here we have another icon uh, of the donkey, specifically labeled here as the Copperhead Papers, which were a series of newsletters and pamphlets and things. Uh, here they are. Uh, beating to death the Honorable Ian Stanton, a uh, judge who got in trouble for doing a lot of things judges aren't supposed to do. And rather than just let him you know, retire in disgrace, the Democrats kept bringing it up over and over and over again. And so Thomas Nast uh, critiqued them and saying that, you know, that he's already dead, just let him go. Another representation here from Harper's Weekly, uh, well after the war in the 1870s. Uh, here we have the Democratic Party doing its best to run off a cliff. Uh, but uh, we have some leaders in Washington trying to prevent those things. So a few labels explaining here and there. Uh, and meanwhile, we have the Republican vote, which since the war has died off, uh, even being looked over by uh, Lincoln, who had recently been assassinated. So kind of a ghost of the past. Here's a cover of Harper's Weekly, uh, talking about the civil service reform and, and the need for it, which another icon created by... Thomas Nast, Uncle Sam. So which Uncle Sam, the kind of representation for the United States, goes back uh, all the way to the 1810s, but he'd had a lot of different incarnations. There's actually a lot of them where he's short and kind of pudgy fellow. But Thomas Nast always drew him as this older guy with a goatee, uh, wearing striped pants and blue shirt, and uh, the thing that we see every July 4th now. So once again, just his image was so popular that people ran with it. And here we have some commentary of Uncle Sam looking on, uh, just not quite sure what he's thinking of this image of uh, the need for civil service reform, because right now it's talking about uh, a hungry dog will steal. If you want a good watchdog, you need to pay a good price for him. Uh, if you starve him, of course, he's going to steal the food. So if you want to uh, punish people for stealing, cut their tails off, right? No, of course not. 
that's giving us the clear image that people will steal if they need to eat. So what we need to do is resolve the issue before we try to just punish people out of doing what they need to to survive. The biggest accomplishment of Thomas Nast was taking down the famous Tweed Ring that was running out of Tammany Hall. So Tammany Hall, the to this day Democratic Party in uh, New York, where uh, they've been operating there since it was founded by a guy named Alexander Hamilton. You may have seen his musical. But what they wanted to do uh, in this very corrupt time in American politics was um, manipulate votes and see what they can do to get people in charge and, and hijack money. So a lot of people were doing this. Uh, a lot of presidents were mixed up in this too later on. But focusing on New York, we had this guy, Boss Tweed, who rang this Tweed ring. And he had all of his cronies, and uh, as this image shows, just thought about money all the time. So, uh, electing their president, uh, the Democratic president, Cleveland, twice from the Democratic Party with the Tammany Tiger, people representing uh, kind of the uh, effectiveness, the, the image they wanted, kind of like their Democratic donkey and the Republican elephant. But here we show, see the tiger is not doing so well. He's missing an eye. He's been in prison. He's uh, got uh, uh, his tail just kind of stitched back on. Uh, but they give him a nice new shirt. They say, oh, it's, you know, it's Cre Glover Cleveland. He's a good guy from Ohio. Let's vote for him. And uh, unfortunately, corruption and fraud did follow a lot of those uh, era presidencies. Going back to New York, uh, Boss Tweed had all of his cronies here. And there were cases in which people were asking, you know, who stole the people's money, which is this question right here. Do tell, and they reply, well, tells him. And they had gotten enough people into office that they could just poke things over on other people's offices. The attorney general uh, couldn't get anybody to cooperate for evidence. Um, attorney generals would get voted out and uh, corrupt ones would get put in that would bust other people. Uh, it was really bad. And this was a time before we had like, secret votes and uh, we had much corruption. So uh, people would legitimately stand outside of the polling station with a dollar and they would say, hey, I'll give you a dollar if you go vote for this guy. And wanting a dollar, you'd say fine. And you'd vote and get him elected. And then he would get into office and you know give uh, big stacks of money to other people and kickbacks and just a real whole pork barrel issue. And for years, there was nothing you could do about it, uh, just because they would get voted back in office. Uh, eventually, that was clearly bribery, so that was made illegal. Uh, but other things would come in, such as people standing outside the polling stations with baskets full of uh, beers. And you'd say, hey, you want a bottle? Uh, vote for me and I'll give you one. And you'd go in and vote and you'd come out and get your bottle. And they would keep an eye over your shoulder to make sure you weren't trying to pull a fast one on them. So everybody knew this was going on, uh, but the problem is, what do you do about it? And uh, Thomas Nast, once again, all he could do was draw, and so he drew. And he drew their faces over and over again. He'd draw what these people look like, so people would know them in the street. And that eventually did become a problem. Here we have a portrayal of Boss Tweed being bigger than the law, right? The law can catch the average man, no problem. But when it comes to Boss Tweed, he's a giant, just looking down smugly, doing whatever he wants. And here we have the famous uh, Tammany Tiger on the loose. What are you going to do about it? The comic asks. So here we have the Coliseum with uh, Boss Tweed and all his cronies up here, once again portrayed by their real faces, so you can tell who they are. And we have a tiger who has just finished uh, killing Lady Liberty. She's, she's smashed and gone. And now it's turning to look at you. So what are you going to do about it? And a lot of people started thinking, well, what are we going to do about it? And these guys knew who they were. And so next election cycle, when people were you know, trying to get into office, they'd stand out there with you know bribes and saying, hey, vote for me. And you say, no, I'm not going to vote for you. In fact, get out of here and chase them off with a stick. Uh, or these people going back and forth to their offices, you'd see them uh, in their carriages and there were legitimate problems. These people had to sneak out uh, because people would attack their carriages in the, in the streets, throw rocks at them, throw uh, stinky bags of vegetables. Uh, they'd find out where their homes are and they'd smash out windows with rocks uh, or they would throw torches in through the windows. Uh, it was not a popular time for these guys and rightfully so because they were legitimately stealing 
tons of money from people. I actually looked it up, and the Tweed Ring is estimated to have stolen $8 billion of taxpayer money from New York City during this time, which that's not adjusted for inflation. That is $8 billion in 1880s money. And Boss Tweed had a lot of plans that went through very well. He, in fact, was mayor of New York for one term. Uh, he decided he didn't like it. It was too much work. Uh, he'd rather be behind the scenes, kind of soaking up the money. And he played kingmaker a lot. Uh, he would get buddies of his into office, uh, such as the city horse manure inspector. Uh, which you'd think, why do we need that? And you, you could come up with some reason saying, well, you know, we have a lot of horse manure in the streets and we need to make sure it all gets cleaned up and all this. And uh, as chief inspector... However, uh, you wouldn't really need to do that because who's watching, uh, as well as having the equivalency of a six-figure salary doing so. Clearly corrupt, and everybody knew it, but the thing was trying to get people passionate enough to do something about it, and Boss Tweed was really taken down by these drawings by Thomas Nast. Uh, there was a quote from uh, Boss Tweed saying that uh, it doesn't matter to me what they write about me in the papers, my constituents can't read. But those damn pictures. So knowing that they were in a lot of trouble, uh, the Tweed Ring actually tried to get rid of Thomas Nast. Uh, they knew they couldn't like kill him or anything because he was very popular and they'd know where to point that finger very quickly. Uh, instead, Thomas Nast uh, got a telegram and it notified him that he had won a scholarship from the city of New York. And uh, it was offering uh, $100,000 to go to Paris and study for a year. So as an artist, this is what he's always wanted. You know, all he has to do is move to Paris, uh, give up this cartooning and so forth. But uh, Thomas Nast knew obviously this is taxpayer money, uh, which that's the equivalency of $1.6 million today. Uh, and he wouldn't do it. And he said, no, I'm turning this money down. That's ridiculous. Um, and so they got back in touch with him and said, oh, I'm sorry. Um, thank you for telling us that, but uh, we wanted to let you know there was a, a mistake, a typo in that. It's not 100,000, it's 500,000, uh, which if you want to keep your career in publishing, you can, just just uh, don't draw any pictures about us. And that was very suspicious. So of course, Thomas Nast ended up drawing uh, cartoons about that. And with the tide turning, eventually Boss Tweed and his cronies did get voted out of office, and a lot of them uh, were busted by the new attorney general coming in. And eventually, Boss Tweed himself came under prosecution. They uh, wrote up a warrant, they went to his house to pick him up, and he was gone. Uh, he was out of the city. There, there was a big mass search, and nobody could find him. And it wasn't until about six or eight months later, in uh, Spain of all places, Barcelona, some of the dock workers were looking at the American embassy's uh, newspapers, which among them, of course, was Harper's Weekly. And they... Uh, couldn't really, you know, read all the English, but they could understand the pictures. And in all these pictures, they were seeing this big guy who looked like that new guy that had just signed up to work at the docks with them. A guy who spoke with a, a really heavy accent. And they pointed it out to the American embassy. They went and picked him up. And Boss Tweed was finally taken to prison, where he later died while doing heavy labor in upstate New York. So those pictures do have power. Uh, so Thomas Nath... Very nice guy, but just to show that there are multiple sides of every story, uh, he was also vehemently anti-Catholic. Uh, here is his image about the American Ganges River, and the collapse of the American public schools, and how uh, people are uh, either getting carted off for execution, or all the kids are just being dumped on this uh, kind of uh, riverbed here to be picked off by the Catholic schools because the American public school system is failing. Um, here he is critiquing the Irish and African Americans, saying that they are in fact equal, uh, which is a shocking statement to to this day, let alone in the 1880s. So certainly not what we would talk about being PC today. So we always need to keep a careful eye on who our heroes are and judge them by the whole of their character. But the major takeaway from that is uh, the power of these images. So just as we've seen all over the internet with memes, if you want a message to keep alive, keep an image with it. Otherwise, Boss Tweed could still really well be in power. <laughs>